Good afternoon. Welcome to the first meeting of the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor for the 82nd Legislative Session. Ms. Axels Axelson, please call roll. Assemblywoman Bacchus. Present. Assemblyman Carter. Present. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Assemblywoman Howdigy. Here. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Here. Assemblywoman Torres. Here. Assemblyman Yeager. Here. Assemblyman Yurek. Here. Chair Marzola. Here. Please mark Assemblywoman Hardy excused. Welcome everyone here in Carson City. Everyone joining us by video conference in Las Vegas and anyone tuning in over the internet. Just to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna do today, we're gonna have introductions, adoption of committee policies and presentations from committee staff and the Department of Business and Industry. Before I get started, I would like to make some housekeeping announcements. Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor is scheduled to meet at 1.30 p.m. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We will begin each meeting on time. We apologize for today. We were having some technical issues. Agenda items may be taken in a different order than listed. Two or more agenda items may be combined for consideration. An item may, may be removed from the agenda or discussion of an item on the agenda may be delayed at any time. Members of the public may provide testimony in various ways, all of which are listed on the agenda. The chair or a member of the committee may request testifiers to submit documentation supporting their testimony. When testifying, please turn the microphones on to speak and off to listen. We have listeners and viewers in Las Vegas and online. We are recording this meeting as well, so it will be available in the legislature's website later. If you have handouts for the committee, please provide 20 copies to the committee secretary prior to your testimony. In addition, exhibits and amendments must be submitted electronically as a PDF file to our committee manager no later than noon on the business day before the meeting. If you could submit those earlier, that'd be very much appreciated. Committee information is available on Ellis, which can be accessed through the legislature's website. You may also watch our meeting through Nellis or the legislator, legislature's YouTube channel. We ask that public comments be kept to two minutes so that everyone interested in speaking can be accommodated. And this also ensures we get through the agenda in a timely fashion. Speakers are urged to avoid repeating comments made by previous speakers. Public comment may be submitted in writing either in addition to testifying or in lieu thereof. Written public comment may be submitted before, during, or up to 24 hours after the meeting has adjourned. I expect courtesy and respect in all of our interactions, even if we may disagree. Finally, please turn off your electronic devices, especially cell phones, or put them on silent mode during this meeting. With that, we will move to our first agenda item. I would like to take a few minutes to introduce members of the committee and committee staff. Members, if each of you would introduce yourselves, please include the district you represent. Let us start with our vice chair, Assemblywoman Howdigy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Assemblywoman Sandra Howdigy. I will this is my fourth session on commerce and labor. I had the opportunity to chair commerce and labor in 2021 and I'm looking forward to another successful session. Thank you. Let's next go to speaker Yeager. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. My name is Steve Yeager. I represent Assembly District 9, which is in Southwest Las Vegas. Uh, this is my fourth session, um, I believe. 
Yes, and it's my second time on Commerce and Labor. I was on this committee in 2019 and then was on a different committee last time, but uh, really excited to be back on this committee. Uh, we're going to work hard. I know we're going to hear a lot of bills, and I'm really excited to serve under your leadership, Madam Chair and uh, Madam Vice Chair. So thanks for having me. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is uh, Assemblywoman B. Duran. I represent District 11. This is my second time, or second session on Commerce and Labor, and this is my third session in, in the Assembly. And I look forward to working with everybody. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Assemblywoman Danielle Monroe Moreno. I represent Assembly District 1, which is the best district in the state. That's why it's number one. Uh, it's primarily in the city of North Las Vegas. This is my fourth term in the legislature and my first assignment to Commerce and Labor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before I start with my life's history, I have one question, if I may ask, to the speaker. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> uh, I'm P.K. O'Neill. I have uh, Assembly District 40, which I'm proud of representing. It, it includes all of Carson City, all of Story County, and the eastern side of Washoe County, along 395, up along up to the... Um, City of Sparks, city limits, and along the edge of Reno city limits. This is my third term, and, my, and I'm honored or privileged to actually say this is also my third time in Commerce and Labor. I look forward to working with you and uh, the fun that we'll have for the next 178 days. Thank you, Chair. I'm still trying to figure out when I took my first steps, okay? <laughs> I will clarify it is 120 days. <laughs> um, Assemblywoman Shea Backus, please. Thank you, Chair. My name is Shea Backus. I am the representative from Assembly District 37, which is in the northwest part of Las Vegas, inclusive of Desert Shores, a sliver of the Pueblo, Sun City, Summerlin, and some of the Lone Mountain um, area. Um, this is my second session um, after and um, first time on commerce and labor thank you chair assemblywoman heidi kasama representing assembly district two um, almost as good as one right coming right after that so i'm on the west side of the las vegas valley uh, the summerlin area is uh, mainly what my district comprises this is my Second session and my second time on Commerce and Labor. Enjoyed the committee very much. Um, we do a lot regarding industry in the state, and I look forward to all the bills we'll be hearing and passing good legislation for our state. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Assemblyman Salana Torres, and I represent uh, the third district here in the state of Nevada, probably the best, but sometimes it takes a couple of tries first. Um, and this is my first time serving on this committee um, and my third session. Hello, I'm Max Carter. I represent Assembly District 12, the extreme eastern side of the Las Vegas Valley, wrapping around Sunrise Mountain and taking in a little bit of the north side of Henderson. And this is my first session and first time on this committee. Thank you, Chair. Toby Urich, I have the privilege of representing Assembly District 19, that beautiful part of Southern Henderson that wraps around Lake Mead and goes into the rurals of Mesquite and Overton and Logandale area. Uh, this is my first time. I was elected for the first time in November, and so it's also my first time serving here in Commerce and Labor. Thank you. Thank you to all members of the committee. I'm Assemblywoman Elaine Marzola, and I represent Assembly District 21. I have part of Henderson, Green Valley area. I believe I have the best district, but we'll fight about it later. <laughs> um, I am honored to serve with my committee members, and I'm honored to chair this committee. Thank you, um, Speaker, for assigning me this committee. 
I've lived in Nevada for almost 39 years. I have a son that was born and raised in Las Vegas. So Nevada is definitely where I have set my roots and where I call home. Um, I've been an attorney for almost 12 years. Time flies. Um, and I have owned owned my own law firm for almost four. All the topics that we cover in our committee are very important to me and are important to our state. Topics relating to labor and employment issues, regulation of occupation and professions, and insurance, just to name a few of the topics that we touch here. Um, I look forward to a very good committee, a lot of discussion, and hopefully some good legislation is passed through this committee. My goal as chair is to create a space of professionalism and fairness. I expect everyone, every single person, to treat each other with courtesy and respect, and nothing else will be tolerated. With that, I would like to introduce my committee staff. Committee manager, Cindy Latour. Are you here? This is her first session with the assembly. Previously, she managed traffic departments in the broadcast and cable industry for over 20 years. She loves spending time with her big, crazy, fun-loving family. She's an outdoor enthusiast who enjoys trail riding and hiking. Her goal is to hike the Camino de Santiago within the next two years. Welcome, Cindy. Next is Julie Axelson. She is returning as committee secretary. This is her fifth legislative session. Where are you? <laughs> she worked with the Judiciary Committee for two sessions, and this is her third session with Commerce and Labor. She has two master's degree, one in European history and one in academic advising. Although she does not have a lot of time for hobbies since she has two children, she likes to go to the ocean and spend time on the beach with her family. Our second committee secretary is Elizabeth LePay. Where are you, Elizabeth? This is her first legislative session. As a first-generation Nevadan, she was born and raised in Carson City. She graduated from the University of Reno, Nevada with a bachelor's degree in English literature. When she is not solo traveling, she enjoys cooking, reading, and listening to records. Our third committee secretary is Spencer Wines. <laughs> this is his first legislative session. He recently graduated with a bachelor's degree in history. In his free time, he enjoys photography. We also have a committee secretary, Garrett Kingson. Next is Marjorie Pazlov Thomas. She would be our committee policy analyst. <laughs> she has been with the research division of the Legislative Council Bureau since 1998. This is her sixth session as policy analyst for Commerce and Labor Committee. She has a master's degree in public policy and administration from Baylor University. Our committee councils are busy working on drafting bills and are not here today, but I would like to introduce them. First, Sam Quest has been with the LCB since August 2018. Originally from Illinois, he graduated from Illinois State University in 2015 and the University of Illinois College of Law in 2018. From 2008 to 2012, he served in the United States Navy as a cryo logic technician abroad the USS Pickney. Next, Joey Stegmeyer was born and raised in Indiana and worked in sports journalism for a couple of years before attending law school at the University of Iowa. He has served as deputy legislative counsel at the LCB for three years. In his free time, he likes to hike, grill, and watch soccer and college basketball. In addition, Crystal Rowe, Research Policy Assistant, will be assisting our committee as well. Finally, Natalie Dean. She is my attache de session. She was born and raised in Northern Nevada. She graduated from the University of Nevada with a degree in political science. This is her first legislative session. In her free time, she raises two children and spends time with their horses. 
I want to thank in the beginning all the staff and also PBS staff for all that you do to support all our members in this committee in its entirety throughout this whole session. We could not do this without you. So thank you so much. Now let's get started. Our first order of business is the adoption of the committee's policies, which are posted in the legislature's website. These policies are fairly, fairly standard and similar to those approved in other committees. They serve to complement the assembly standing rules and the joint standing rules that we adopted on Monday in the full assembly. I would like to highlight a few of the policies. First, members of the committee are expected to report promptly at the designated time for committee meetings, which are at 1.30 p.m. on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Members will also notify the chair in advance if they must leave the committee for an extended period of time, such as testifying on their bills. Also, I would like to ask any member who votes in favor of passing a bill or adopting an amendment in the committee to advise the chair of any change in his or her vote before the vote by the full assembly. Are there any questions? If not, I will take a motion to adopt the policies for Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. So moved. Second. I have a motion from Assemblywoman Howdigy and a second from Assemblywoman Kasama. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Next, our committee policy analyst, Margie Thomas, will present the committee policy brief. Thank you, Madam Chair. Margie Thomas with the Research Division of the Legislative Council Bureau. Uh, I am your nonpartisan professional staff, and I will be serving as the committee policy analyst this session. Everyone should have a copy of the committee brief, which has been uploaded to Nellis, and I believe there are some hard copies out in the audience. Uh, just briefly, since I know this is the third time everyone has gone through these committee briefs, I will just highlight that um, this, the Commerce and Labor Committee has traditionally been one of the three busiest policy committees. Uh, last session, um, this committee heard 111 bills and resolutions. So by April 14th, which is the first committee passage deadline, based on the number of meetings, uh, this committee would have to hear roughly two and a half to three bills every meeting to uh, complete their business. The committee jurisdiction includes banks, financial institutions, and similar entities, businesses, occupations, and professions, commercial instruments and transit transactions, insurance, labor and industrial relations, um, manufactured housing, and trade practices and regulations. Um, there are several policy issues that may arise on this session, and those are contained on page two. There are also some relevant audits and reports um, by the legislative auditor. I believe everyone on this committee has received information about the audits that were conducted recently that pertain to commerce and labor, as well as there was the Joint Interim Standing Committee on Commerce and Labor, which has two committee bills that may or may not go through this committee. And um, finally, there are reports of occupational licensing boards where they are most Boards are required to submit reports of disciplinary action and regulatory activities to the LCB, and that is uh, available online. And finally, um, there is committee staff contact information if you should need to get a hold of uh, any of the committee staff. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Seeing none. Next, we have a presentation from the Department of Business and Industry. Joining us today is Director Terry Reynolds. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman. We uh, have a short presentation. I want to try to leave some time for questions on this. Uh, a little bit about my background, uh, I've been with business and industry since 2013. 
Uh, I was uh, appointed director in 2019 with two previous stints as interim uh, director. So a uh, little bit of experience uh, here, but um, our, our industries are always changing. And so um, things are always pretty fluid in, in uh, the areas that we oversee. Uh, to my right is Perry Fagan. He's my interim deputy director. Perry has been with us for approximately six years and served in, in three different uh, agencies with our department. So pretty, uh, pretty familiar with uh, business and industry. Uh, to my back, over on the side here is uh, <clears throat> James Hansen, uh, also known as Dale Hansen. Uh, Dale is our ASO4. Uh, also, uh, you will get to know Dale because he does all the uh, uh, fiscal notes, he and Heather Saunders, uh, within our department and is our budget uh, person. So he's here sitting in today in case there's any questions that, uh, that I can't answer, he'll help me out. So with that, I'll get into the presentation. Uh, the Department of Business and Industry consists of the director's office and 11 different uh, agencies. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go over these in a little more detail in the next slide. Uh, to really understand business and industry, we've developed this chart and we broke it into four separate areas. Uh, commerce and regulation, community development, small business, labor and workforce protection, and advocacy and advancement. Under commerce and capital regulation, we have uh, financial institutions. We uh, oversee depository and non-depository uh, institutions within our state. Uh, insurance division, mortgage lending. We uh, oversee mortgage brokers as well as mortgage servicers. Uh, and thank you to the legislature because previous to that, we had not um, had the authority to, to regulate and oversee uh, mortgage servicers. Uh, the real estate division, and with that and underneath the real estate division is also the uh, common interest community. So, and I'll go into that in a little more detail, but uh, we, you'll break it up into two, two areas, basically the real estate uh, timeshare education appraisal, and then on the other side, the HOA side. Uh, taxi cab authority, and the Nevada Transportation Authority. The taxi cab authority only handles uh, taxis within Clark County and the Nevada Transportation Authority handles taxis everywhere else, plus buses, limos, shuttles, uh, tow cars, uh, movers, uh, all the state uh, transportation agencies outside of, of Clark County. So pretty, uh, pretty expansive uh, duties within their division. Labor and Workforce Protection, we have the Office of Labor Commissioner. Uh, also, most recently, we have the Executive Director for Apprenticeships and the Apprenticeship Council located in the Office of Labor uh, Commissioner. We have the Employee Management Relations Board who deals with uh, contract issues with all public employees. And most recently, the State of Nevada employees fell underneath that uh, umbrella. Industrial Relations, there are five sectors in Industrial Relations. There's Workers' Compensation, there's the Mechanical Unit, that's boilers, escalators, elevators uh, throughout the state. We also have OSHA. Mine safety, this is the uh, safety training for mines within the, uh, within the state. Uh, we have offices also in Winnemucca and Elko, as well as Carson, uh, Reno, and, uh, and Las Vegas on that. And then SCATS, Safety Consultation and Training Organization. Uh, they're most uh, commonly known for the, the 1030 cards that, uh, that workers get for training uh, so they can get employed. But, uh, and they do an excellent job, but they cover a lot of uh, area. We also have a, uh, a voluntary uh, safety program that we have large uh, businesses within, and that is growing. I think we're up to, what, 37, Perry, uh, <coughs> businesses. Uh, Boyd Gaming, for example, is one of those areas uh, working right now with Tesla uh, on their safety programs. And so we have um, a lot of different areas that, uh, that we work with under safety training. Community development, small business uh, in Las Vegas in our Clark County office. We have the Office of Business Finance and Planning. Their principal responsibility is dealing with small business uh, and adding assistance to, for small business for entrepreneurs, uh, for training, uh, everything from uh, getting finances to labor issues to how to start up, uh, how to work with um, 
with other businesses in terms of purchasing uh, or, or uh, suppliers that they need to work with. Uh, we have a relationship with the, uh, um, a lot of the uh, uh, chambers within both uh, areas of the state, both north and south. Uh, we deal with the uh, Asian chamber, the Latin chamber, urban chamber, uh, and the other chambers within both uh, Clark County and Washoe County. Uh, so we have good relationships and, and work with them on putting on programs uh, for small business. We also have, uh, as, a, as a state, we are the uh, private activity housing charters school bond conduit issuer. So we work with uh, the uh, Board of Finance and we issue uh, as a conduit issuer, meaning we're not responsible for the payment of that, but we work uh, to uh, issue bonds within the state. So we do all the industrial revenue, housing bonds, charter school bonds, uh, and uh, um, any kind of specialty uh, economic development bond, we're involved in that. Housing, uh, housing we have uh, several programs and I'll get into that, plus we also do uh, weatherization grants and we help a lot of people weatherize uh, through grants, uh, their homes or their uh, mobile homes or uh, even their apartments where we work, or condos where we work on weatherization projects for them. We also handle the new market tax credit program. Uh, that was instituted by the legislature in 2013. It's been renewed uh, for another cycle in 2019. And I have been with that program since the inception of it. Uh, Nevada has been very successful in this program. And I think now we're up to um, about 55 businesses that have been financed uh, through that program, uh, principally in uh, low income areas or uh, with uh, people that are in the poverty level and bringing them up uh, into for jobs, uh, but we've been very successful in that area. Advocacy and advancement in the director's office uh, down in Las Vegas, we have the Office of Consumer Affairs. <coughs> that only consists of actually seven people, five in the south and two in the north, but they handle about 2,000 cases a year uh, within their, their office, and we have a, a clearance rate, a success rate of about 93%. So we're able to really help consumers out within the state. Uh, we have some very dedicated employees within that. Uh, those are the same employees that have been with us for like the last eight years. So they enjoy their jobs and they do a, a very good job on it. Uh, we also have the, uh, the Commission on Minority Affairs. Uh, Legislative Council appoints those members to the, to the commission. Uh, and I have to thank you because we have a very good commission. Um, they do a lot of educational work um, and work with uh, minority populations throughout the state. So uh, we're very pleased with uh, what they can do in terms of uh, access to information, uh, how to uh, work with the groups that need to advocate uh, and to uh, become active in, in certain issues. Uh, we spend a lot of time working with them on business issues, educational issues, housing issues. Um, so it's a, it's a very active uh, commission. We also have um, the uh, Ombudsman for Minority Affairs, uh, Miriam Laura Hickerson. She does an outstanding job. Um, she is very, uh, works with our uh, Office of Consumer Affairs and uh, helping settle uh, consumer issues within principally the Clark County area, but she does a lot of work too in Northern Nevada. Um, also, we have a housing advocate that really actually deals with principally with senior housing, affordable housing issues within the housing division. So I wanted to point that out. Um, we also have our HOA ombudsman uh, within the real estate that deals with common interest community issues. And uh, in insurance, we have a consumer affairs unit that deals with consumer problems. And uh, you know, we've had this last week, we've had several that we're, we're dealing with individually, but uh, they deal with people from, whether it's homeowners insurance or automobile insurance or uh, liability insurance, they're involved in those. Just an overview of uh, business industry and our funding. Uh, about 1.7% of our funding from BNI comes from the state general fund. The rest is industry fees uh, and uh, transfers. We actually, because the 
director's office is a consolidated function for uh, budgeting for, uh, and it's a fairly unique model with departments with, within the state, but we consolidated everything from IT to budgeting, accounts payables, receivables, travel. Um, we have all that within the director's office, and then we cost allocate back uh, to our divisions uh, because of the way we're funded. As I indicated, what we do in the director's office, we provide direct support to our 11 divisions, uh, centralized fiscal, budget collections, payroll, uh, human resources, technology, purchasing, for example, uh, financial institutions and Maurice Lending divisions. Uh, we oversee licensing. As a whole, our department issues about 265,000 business licenses a year for industries within the state of Nevada. Minister provisions of law and development regulations and policies. Uh, assist with economic development. I'm a member of GOED, not voting, but I'm a member of GOED, so I work on uh, economic development projects within the state of Nevada. We also help finance them uh, from time to time uh, on that. Uh, we uh, advocate and, and protect uh, consumers uh, and minority affairs uh, within our department. We provide constituent services across the state uh, for people that have issues that we need to help. Uh, with whatever, it doesn't have to be with our department. Uh, we get them to the right person or right entity to be able to help them. Uh, as I indicated, we do private activity, charter school, housing bonds, and we have a state uh, conduit issuer for bonds. Nevada gets uh, an authorization from IRS <coughs> for tax exempt bonds. Every state in the United States does that. It's based on population within the state uh, this last year, we had about $345 million that came in the state. 50% goes to local uh, governments, 50% goes to the director's office. Whatever is not used by local government at the end of uh, September comes back and is, comes back to the director's office, and we allocate that either for industrial development uh, or housing. Lately, we've been putting it into housing, uh, so that allocation or authorization by IRS goes into housing. If we don't use it by, uh, it's a calendar year uh, authorization. If we don't use it by the end of the calendar year, then it goes, uh, we can designate it for a three year period of time um, for specific use. And so lately we've been doing that for housing. Uh, that has been very successful. It's for private development to come in and we do bonds with that, them uh, for that authorization so we can issue tax exempt bonds for their projects. Okay. We also administer the New Market uh, Jobs Act, which I indicated uh, to you earlier. Uh, I'm going to go through our divisions rather quickly, um, but if you have questions after that, uh, please let me know. Uh, Division of Insurance, uh, we protect consumers and ensure solvency of Nevada's insurance providers. Uh, we regulate a $22 billion industry, which has grown by 91% in the last 10 years, so phenomenal growth within the insurance industry. We regulate insurance companies, captives, insurance agents, adjusters, bail bond agents, and other license types in all uh, lines of insurance, including health, life, property, casualty, uh, title insurance, as well as auto and homeowners insurance. Uh, I will tell you that we are, um, we have an interim insurance commissioner. Uh, we have uh, just selected a new insurance commissioner that will be uh, <clears throat> with us probably by the end of February. And uh, we'll, we'll be announcing that in due time. But I, uh, I think you'll be pleased with uh, the person that will be coming in to, to take over. And it will be um, a familiar face that uh, that we have and I have worked with over the years. So we're very pleased to be able to have that person come back. Uh, our primary focus in insurance is to monitor and ensure solvency of the carriers uh, to promote compliance, uh, to keep the, the market in Nevada competitive and adequate. And that's been something that has been a challenge, especially in, in the outlying areas, in the rural areas, is making sure that we have a, a, a good network of insurance providers uh, within our state. 
uh, licensing and education of individuals interacting with consumers, uh, and consumer protection and fraud investigation. Uh, believe it or not, we do have uh, a considerable amount of fraud within the insurance industry, and that's something that's national. So you'll get companies that'll work uh, through other states and come through your state. And, and so we're always working on a national level uh, with insurance fraud. We work with the Attorney General's office on that, but we also work with a coalition of Attorney Generals throughout the United States on, on these matters. Division uh, of Industrial Relations, as I indicated, we have five units there. Uh, workers' Compensation Section, the Occupational Safe and Healthy Health uh, Administration, OSHA. We are uh, a state contract, so you have the federal OSHA, and our programs have to be, and we're evaluated every year on that, have to be as effective as the uh, national OSHA uh, to be able to uh, carry on our contract uh, that we have with federal OSHA uh, through the DOL, Department of Labor. So it's very important for us to have an inadequate program, but a program that we can work with Nevada uh, and our companies within Nevada that we're not uh, that were that bases have I say this uh, politically correct, but <clears throat> that we have a system that works with our Nevada businesses that they're comfortable working with us, that they're not being told what to do on a federal level, because we understand gaming, uh, we understand the tourism industries, we understand the businesses that we have within Nevada. So it's important for us to have that relationship with our our businesses and our consumers within Nevada uh, that we serve. Uh, safety consultation and training, uh, that's the safety side of things, mine safety and training. Uh, we work very closely with mines. Uh, we make sure that they can have a good relationship with MSHA, which is the federal side, um, but we are the state side of helping these mines make sure they are safe um, and that they are uh, training their workers to be able to uh, <coughs> keep a good safety record. I will tell you that in the last 14 months, actually we've had four deaths within the mine industry, which is not acceptable. Uh, and we are working with the mines to make sure that we um, are, are safer. Uh, but with the activity that we have, uh, you're, we know that we're going to have accidents, but we're trying to make sure that we are uh, accident free uh, within the upcoming years. So that is going to be an emphasis area. Mechanical compliance. Uh, that's the regulation of elevators, escalators, boilers, and pressure vestibles, vessels. Uh, we investigate uh, also the accidents that happen. For example, what happened with one of the, uh, the uh, well, there's an explosion in Las Vegas and boiler system uh, at UNR, uh, one of the dorms there. We had a pretty serious explosion there. So our people went and investigated and looked at what we could do to help out to prevent that. Uh, these are substantial uh, issues that uh, really need to be looked at. We work very closely uh, with local officials uh, in there, with local building officials uh, on a statewide basis and a local basis to make sure that we are secure. Nevada Housing Division, what we do, uh, housing programs, we finance multifamily affordable uh, preservation of housing projects. So we can do either new projects or we can go into a project and help them uh, rehabilitate uh, the uh, affordable housing. The good news when we do that is it keeps those places affordable for a period of time for up to 30 years. So it's important for us to be able to go in and make sure that we're, we're managing and rehabilitating those projects to keep them in their affordable housing space. Uh, weatherization assistance, uh, oversight of manufactured housing. Uh, administer federal funding for housing. So HUD dollars that come in or, or dollars that come into the community, uh, we're really kind of a conduit issuer, uh, distributing those dollars to local housing authorities and agencies uh, within the state. Uh, housing database reporting, uh, we do have a rental program um, that we have a database for. It's voluntary, but uh, we can have uh, people that have rental facilities uh, put that on our database and it's a great way for renters to find uh, a place to live. Um, so plug again, how many people, what number of uh, rooms they're looking for, et cetera, and, and a rental um, amount that they would wanna pay. And so this 
uh, allows them to go in and search uh, for that. It's a good search engine. Additional activities, obviously during the pandemic, we've had Home Means Nevada initiative, uh, the 500 million that went into uh, the housing. Uh, <clears throat> we've had a direct financing of the Westside Housing Project in Las Vegas. Uh, homeowners assistance, um, this takes many different forms, but, uh, and then home partnership with, uh, these are ARPA funds, uh, where we go in and help <clears throat> people with uh, downtown or foreclosure uh, issues with uh, mortgage assistance payments, uh, with vouchers, uh, especially in some of the rural areas. Uh, so this is really kind of our, our um, activity that was done during the pandemic. Rental assistance was one of those. Real estate division, uh, as I said, we broke it up into two sections. The first section is in uh, with licensing. So we have real estate licensing, builders, developers, timeshare, appraisers, energy audit, inspection and structures, uh, real estate education. Uh, we have about uh, 4,100 or 41,000, excuse me, uh, licenses. Uh, we handle about 1,200 complaints a year. Uh, we opened about 686 cases. Uh, 84 commission hearings. Uh, the commission really goes through and, and uh, hears complaints, uh, hears issues within the real estate, <clears throat> and about 8,000 calls. Uh, we get uh, pretty busy activity there. On the HOA side, uh, we have about uh, 580 some thousand units within HOAs within the state. Uh, Last, uh, in 22, we added 13,173 uh, units, uh, 97 new associations. We have 769 licensed community managers. Now, interesting here, we don't license uh, the property um, companies. We license the community managers. And that's a, that's a dichotomy that I th think that we'll probably be discussing in the, in the future. Um, we have the HOA ombudsman. The ombudsman works with the commission. A lot of people, we work to with the ombudsman on, on mediating disputes, uh, trying to handle community disputes, but it's really up to the commission, the, H, the Common Interest Commission, to really handle those uh, disputes. So most of those disputes, we try to divert and go to mediation or try to resolve ourselves, but a lot of times they end up before the, the commission. Borey's Lending Division, um, they basically deal with escrow agencies, uh, escrow agents, mortgage companies, mortgage uh, loan originators, covered service providers, mortgage servicers, and credit service organizations. Um, so in terms of numbers, uh, we deal about 13,000 mortgage loan originators, uh, 1,700 mortgage companies uh, within Nevada, 136 mortgage uh, servicers. Most of those are national companies. Uh, 14 escrow agencies and 24 escrow uh, agents in terms of agent corporations that uh, work within Nevada. Financial institutions, as I indicated, we have our depository side. These are state chartered banks in the depository side uh, covering about $26 billion worth of assets. We have eight credit unions, one savings bank, four thrift and uh, what we call an ILC, Industrial Loan uh, Corporation, uh, within Nevada. The Industrial Loan Corporation, uh, Utah has about, I think, 23 or 24 now of those, and we're trying to increase our number of that. FDIC and the Federal uh, Depository uh, people have put kind of a limit on that, and, the, and they have not improved any new ones. Um, we have been working with um, Senator Cortez Masto, to be able to get additional ILCs. And we have several companies in Nevada that would like to establish uh, new ILCs. So we're working to be able to do that. Fiduciary institutions, uh, this is a $60 billion area. We have 26 retail trusts and 34 family trust companies. This is a growing area. We're seeing a lot more uh, trust companies coming in to Nevada. Uh, about Three sessions ago, we modernized our savings and trust laws within Nevada, and that has helped us bring additional trust companies in here. Uh, Non-depository businesses, we have, these are our payday lenders, high interest uh, lender, uh, title lenders. 
We have uh, two private uh, professional guardians, 644 collection agencies, uh, 127 money uh, transmitters, 88 installment lenders, uh, 10 consumer litigation funding companies. This is relatively new in terms of that. And 36 uniform debt managers. We have, <coughs> we are in the process of, on the collection agencies, we have a BDR that basically will modernize um, our collection uh, process to make it more in tune with what's happening on a national level. Uh, financial institutions, uh, I'm going to start from the, on the bottom, but they do annual examinations of depository fiduciaries and non-depository uh, financial institutions. It has been very difficult for us to hold senior examiners uh, because of pay and because of the demand for them. Uh, coming in and they're being hired out into the back end of the private sector. Uh, we process and respond complaints from citizens. We investigate possible violations and take disciplinary enforcement actions. We promote and maintain the public's trust confidence in the state financial system, making sure that banks are healthy uh, and operating so people don't lose their monies uh, within financial institutions. Uh, we facilitate proposals to form uh, new depository financial institutions within the state, and we have several that are looking at our state right now that we're working with, so. <clears throat> we also uh, facilitate the establishment of the fast-growing retail, as I indicated, in family trust operations. Taxi authority, uh, the taxi authority uh, is really coming out of the pandemic well. We were very concerned about them. Uh, literally in one month, we were down to about 12,000 uh, rides in that month. Uh, <clears throat> today, I, I will tell you that we're, we're over a million a month, uh, and we're holding that pretty steady. Uh, the numbers are in here. We have about 3,500 uh, medallions out, 16 cab companies, uh, 3,700 uh, active drivers. Um, as you can see, pre-COVID, we were at about 15.8 million rides. Uh, in FY22, we were at 13.4 million rides, and we're growing. So that's good news. Taxi cab remains an essential mode of trans frontline transportation. Uh, I tell people, and they look at me like, really? But we have to maintain all the public transportation that we have to move the, the tourism industry within Nevada. Uh, as you know, McCarran saw last uh, October, November, about 5 million people uh, come in uh, to the state uh, within the airport, and we continue to see records broken uh, in terms of gaming revenue. Uh, that means we're getting bodies within uh, <coughs> our hotels and our gaming. Uh, tourism uh, is coming back quickly. Uh, we're seeing conventions start to come back. About a year and a half ago, we were only about 30-some percent, and we're now seeing that come back, and then 60 to 70 percent neighborhood, and it should be back up to 100% because there's a lag time in bringing those in. Uh, with the advent of autonomous vehicles coming to the mass market over the next five years, uh, it's likely that traditional taxis, network vehicles, and other forms of transportation will continue as complementary systems. So we're seeing the, um, the autonomous vehicles really want to operate in the space, and the, uh, it's easier for them to do this on the strip uh, or the airport to strip hotels. And then from there, uh, we'll use other forms of transportation to get people around uh, the community. Not going to go through the, the uh, but you can see the current status of revenues, uh, reserves, and, and taxis uh, where we, we have grown and kind of the numbers there. So, Nevada Transportation Authority. The Nevada Transportation Authority regulates the transportation industry, which includes, as I indicated, charter buses, limos, movers, tow cars, tour buses, non-emergency uh, medical transfers, uh, employer van pools, airport transfer services, special services, warehouse permits, uh, transportation network companies, and Thomas vehicles. We license and regulate the what we call TNCs, transportation network companies, Uber and Lyft. We don't regulate drivers. In taxi, on that side, we regulate and, and license the drivers, but we don't regulate and license uh, the drivers with TNCs. Uh, not advocating that, but I just there's a dichotomy between how that's done. 
Uh, current activities is process driver permits, uh, <clears throat> administer new carrier applications. So we get lists of drivers, and when I say that, we get lists of drivers from the TNCs, and that's what we uh, look at. Oversee administrative and enforcement hearings, audit inspections of existing carriers and enforcement of Nevada laws. Active carriers is 478. Certificates by authority, uh, 535. Uh, TNC driver count is around 31,000. Uh, we were down to around 12,000 active drivers. We're back up to about 30,000 active drivers, which is, which is very good. Non-TNC driver count is around 8,400. Office of the Labor Commissioner, uh, major responsibilities are dealing with uh, wage, overtime, breaks, lunches, deductions, employment practices, complaints. Uh, and we get several uh, within our state. Uh, we oversee public works projects, prevailing wage and apprenticeship utilization. Uh, we issue public works project numbers, calculate prevailing wage, uh, apprenticeship utilization act, make sure they're required to have so many apprenticeships that they have those. Uh, other than that, if they can't, uh, we have waivers that we do. Uh, we enforce and investigate potential violations. <clears throat> we also regulate private employment, those are like temp agencies. Uh, or, or gig agencies that have gig workers. Uh, we regulate those. And then we also, as uh, came in Assembly Bill 459 last session, uh, we oversee the Nevada State Apprenticeship Program and trying to work on growing apprenticeships within our state. Office of the Labor Commissioner, uh, the statistics for the fiscal year, and you can see uh, the activity that's involved in that. I'm not gonna go into those individually. Employment uh, Management Relations Board. Uh, we basically, as I indicated, uh, acts as the administrative court resolving disputes under <coughs> uh, unfair labor practice allegations, the scope of bargaining units, um, and which employer's organization, if any, is to represent uh, employee, uh, employees. And we actually uh, oversee the elections for that, and we and we're if there's a count that needs to be done, we're involved in that that count on representation. So, uh, state government, we have 207 local government units, 155 employee organizations, four labor organizations, 255 bargaining units, uh, and then 18,000 state government employees who are eligible uh, to be in a, in a union, uh, and so that represents altogether about 90,200. Uh, local government employees. Uh, the board does a very good job. Uh, they are appointed by the governor uh, on that and they serve specific terms. Um, you, you will see that this has been an issue with a lot of our board members. We have, you have boards in the state that are very active that spend a lot of time uh, and you have boards that are not that active. Um, but they all get the same pay rate. So uh, that, is, that is an issue in trying to find board members. So we have uh, implemented through employee management and Bruce Snyder is our executive director for the EMRB and he has arranged to meet in panels. Uh, we used to have a backlog of cases and he's been able to whittle those down so there really isn't any backlog of cases. He's also um, been able to put all decisions online uh, and included the Legislative Council Bureau's Nevada Law Library on a CD so you can get all those uh, those decisions, you can look up decisions and they're all uh, online or on a CD. So uh, it's been very helpful for the attorneys that, that represent clients in this area and for the board members who wanna look up cases. Attorney for Injured uh, Workers, <clears throat> they provide legal representation to injured workers seeking workers' compensation benefits. Uh, they also handle appeals. Uh, if you look at current activities, uh, in 22, they handled over uh, 900 cases uh, each year. So basically they consist of, of legal personnel, uh, uh, paralegals and attorneys, uh, legal assistants that handle cases for injured workers. Uh, appeals hearings, 478. Uh, appeals to district courts, 12. Appeals to Supreme Court, two. Decisions and settlement wins. <clears throat> 373 wins this last year. That's about a that's about a, a rate of about 78 percent that they prevailed in. So they're very effective uh, for Nevada's injured workers, 
uh, and recover a lot of, uh, uh, of medical assistance dollars back to those injured workers. Uh, <clears throat> we have, and I'm not going to get into these real specifically, but we have uh, several budget BDRs, four of them, that uh, will be into bills. I will tell you that in the area of insurance, uh, dealing with SIGs, uh, we're working with the insurance industry on that, representatives, and we will probably withdraw that or will significantly amend it. Um, there's been some issues that we're working with the insurance industry on, and so we're, um, we hope to, to achieve a cooperative relationship with them in dealing with that, so we're not trying to uh, force anything <clears throat> to the insurance industry with that. So, so we're looking at what our options are, but uh, that's under current discussion, but I thought you should know. Okay. And that concludes my presentation. I'm sorry, it went a little longer than thought, but i uh, be happy to answer any questions. No problem. Thank you for your presentation. We do have some questions from members. Assemblywoman Backus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Director Reynolds, for your presentation. I've had the benefit to kind of sit through it twice, and you pick yeah. up things <laughs> that you miss um, the first time. But um, I kind of have a lengthy question sure. and kind of part statement. Um, first and foremost, I was able to look at your business resource center, which I am right. very impressed with all of the resources that's on it. As a small business owner, it seems very user friendly and has a lot of different links. And I realized that it provides mm -hmm. numerous resources for small businesses, also includes info to provide small businesses with understanding of current regulations. Um, um, including like industry, the industry of business, which is also under you guys, um, and also licensing, also has resources to assist a new business to start and growing their business, and a lot of other resources, mm -hmm. including reference to the Secretary of State for dealing with silver flume issues. Um, and then if that all fails, I understand that an individual that may be a small business owner could actually contact your division. And so with that, do you by chance know about how many small businesses maybe contact you all each year and maybe the traffic that goes through this website that you guys are able to help small businesses out with? So <clears throat> um, I can't get it off the top of my head, but I can get you those statistics. Terry Reynolds, for the record, excuse me. Uh, we have Google Analytics that we, we work with. And so we know um, what the, uh, the um, rate of people coming into our website is and how many. I can tell you that uh, from a call standpoint, it's in the thousands. Uh, we have basically per month probably 1,500 to 2,000 calls uh, on, on business programming. We do also have a business roundtable that we conduct every other month, and we have about 80 five to 90 participants, and we try to highlight specific areas uh, on that. So we may have uh, the Secretary of State's office come one month uh, <clears throat> and go through their programs, or um, the Lieutenant Governor's office uh, and talk about uh, their programs. Uh, so we try to, to um, do those type of programs, and you can, they're online. Um, it's usually done virtually because that way we can get statewide participation um, and it's been very, very effective. And then we put out a, a, a business newsletter uh, weekly uh, so people can see you know, what program activities we're working on. So, uh, and then we have a website, uh, we do LinkedIn, um, Facebook, all the social media portions of that. But uh, we do do regular programming which is highlighted in our newsletter and through our uh, business roundtable that we have, which we have great participation from the chambers. Uh, we always have a representative uh, <clears throat> from the Secretary of State's office and different uh, business offices throughout the community, but it's, it's very active. I appreciate that. Chair, may I ask just a follow-up question? Go ahead. Um, you kind of mentioned, I didn't want to put you on the spot, but um, you had mentioned also the Lieutenant Governor's Correct. Office um, of Small Business Advocacy. Do you know how those two differ between all of the resources you all are providing and what the Lieutenant Governor's Office for Small Business Advocacy is? I'm trying to kind of identify the difference between the two. 
So we, we actually advocated for that during the time that that was put in because we felt that it was a good, uh, it was good for businesses to have kind of a neutral area. If they were having a, an issue with one of our agencies that, um, you know, and they were hesitant to call us, that we felt that that was a good outlet for a business to be able to talk to Lieutenant Governor's office and then we would work through with them to solve those issues. So we felt it was positive. I think there's a lot of growth that can happen there and, and uh, that advocate, that advocate uh, was located in our office for a long time. We actually provided the office space uh, for that person, uh, for Sonny during the, that time. Uh, who's now in the governor's office uh, helping with small business. Um, so <clears throat> we work very closely with uh, them on on business issues and getting uh, you know feedback from what areas and calls that they're seeing. We also have uh, monthly meetings with the Secretary uh, of State uh, and, and issues with Silver Flume. And I say issues, I mean just you know interfacing and making sure that uh, we, we're getting feedback on both sides uh, of the uh, of the aisle from working with them on business issues. Okay. Next, we'll go to Assemblywoman Haudegui. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director. Um, I just, I have a quick question because I want to understand how the um, agency works when it comes to um, the divisions and overseeing non-compliance from people that you guys um, oversee. So does the Department of Business and Industry, when it comes to enforcement of things or collection of fines or assessing fines, does that come from the Department of Business and Industry or does each one of your 12 divisions have its own mechanism to enforce their regulations, um, assess fines, and then... Um, and collect them. <laughs> so, uh, Terry Reynolds, for the record, uh, Director for Business and Industry, the uh, decision as to whether um, you know a business is fined or there's a there's an issue going on with, with a segment in business that they're operating, say, without a license or they're um, having issue with fraud on that, that is done through our individual agency. However, they always let us know. Uh, we have a, you know, make sure we communicate uh, with them. Uh, I would say, Perry, we probably communicate um, with every agency every week, um, pretty much. So we're very familiar, and we have standardized meetings with, with all of our 11 agencies that we work through, and, and that's part of the kind of the template of area that we ask them what issues they're facing. Um, the fines, uh, unless they're specifically indicated within statute, uh, all go to the general fund. So, um, but there are some, there are some uh, fines that come back and go to specific areas or fees that go, for example, uh, when we review um, subdivision maps uh, in the real estate division, that the fees for that come back in to, to be able to handle the staff to do that and we have an expediting fee that, that builders can um, pay and that goes to help any overtime that we use to be able to expedite the service for them to get a map approved. Yes, Vice Chair. Thank you. And just a quick follow-up, Director Reynolds. And so is there, amongst your 11 divisions, is, is there uniformity into what kind of um, like enforcement they have, enforcement authority they have, um, or is it just in, individualized for each division in statute? It's individualized, Terry Reynolds for the record, it's individualized by the statute. So it's usually outlined in the statutory authority that that agency has. So there's specific areas for insurance, real estate, um, mortgage lending, uh, even taxing and NTA in terms of what they can do. Uh, the interesting thing is in NTA, they have a very um, developed administrative process that's in statute that they follow uh, on that. And so they're more, um, more regulated, but I think, in my opinion, it's more organized in terms of what they can do, that the commissioners can do in there. Um, I would like to see more uniformity across all of our divisions, but that's gonna take individual statutory uh, amendments across the board. Uh, which is kind of arduous, but we're looking at we're looking at our regulations now and what's what's obsolete. Um, you know, as we discussed in taxi and NTA, 
Uh, some of those uh, authorities and laws are 50 years old uh, and need to be modernized. <clears throat> and so we're working to be able to do that. Um, but we're in you know, multiple statutes, um, and it makes it very difficult to try to combine everything together. But we're looking at it. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I believe we have a bill for that coming out of yes, Sunset Subcommittee. Next, we'll go to Assemblyman O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I may, I have three questions. They're different, each one. Hopefully, short answers. <laughs> go ahead. Please make them quick. <laughs> I have always wanted to ask, can you explain to me in a thousand words or less the difference why you have the taxi cab authority in Clark County only and NTA takes care of all the other 16 counties for their cabs. Thousand words or less, please. <laughs> <clears throat> Terry Reynolds for the record. Uh, excellent question, uh, Assemblyman O'Neill. Uh, as you know, um, in the past I have advocated uh, to have, uh, to look at consolidation of those two, two entities. Uh, generally, uh, taxi is, uh, they are uh, run as an authority in licensing. Uh, it is extremely important to the, uh, the casino industry in terms of being able to have safe, clean uh, transportation within those areas. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the county and the gaming and industries that they serve have been very parochial in terms of making sure that <clears throat> those industries are uh, regulated and there uh, to help them move people uh, from the airport to their properties and around the community. Where the NTA was more of and has been an area that deals more with uh, everything else, you might say. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, I think that there's a model that we could look at uh, in the future that would combine that and look at one transportation agency uh, and modernize the statutes uh, and modernize the, the methods of which <clears throat> we handle disputes, fines, uh, uh, licensing within that. So um, that's where I'd like to see in the future us head, and I think we need to do that. I appreciate that, and I'd love to hear more offline because I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. I think we have duplications, and it would run better in a consolidated and have better performance to the uh, customers as a whole. My other question is, on NTA, do they also regulate or inspect the air medical transport units? Not, I know they don't do the planes, if I understand correctly, or the chopper or helicopters. Terry Reynolds, for the record, they uh, regulate non-medical transport. So the counties uh, on medical transport uh, for your um, basically paramedic units that come through. And, and when you work with uh, air transport, and then there's a, there's a air portion of that and there's a ground portion of it. Uh -huh. <clears throat> the counties regulate the ground medical portion of it. We regulate the non-medical portion of transportation. Thank you. And my last question, Chair, I promise. Um, I'm curious about, um, I think you call it workplace um, heat regulations or violations when outside labor gets to a certain temperature. Uh, there's regulations restricting yeah. that verbiage or activity. Terry, Terry Reynolds, for the record, we do not have regulations within the, in the state uh, yet uh, on that. However, the federal OSHA is looking at um, standards for uh, heat, um, heat standards. And we've had difficulty in terms of coming up with something that operates in Nevada um, because of our extreme heats. And, um, you know, it's different between human communities and, and dry communities and, and, uh, and temperatures uh, on that. So I think that's, that's going to be work in progress. But right for right now, uh, we don't have anything. We're relying on the federal standard. That's one of the things that I think is important for Nevada to realize is that with our own OSHA standards, we can develop a standard that tailored for our community and our workforce here, 
But for right now, um, I don't think we're ready for that yet. And I don't think the businesses are ready for that. There's a lot of work that, and one of the th areas that, without getting into too much detail on it, is really with in restaurants and indoor uh, facilities. We, we tend to think of that standard as outdoor facilities, and it is, but it's also with indoor uh, operations. And that's one of the things that how do you differentiate? You know, it's not a one size fits all. So how do you differentiate between inside workforce and outside workforce uh, and having standards for, to meet, you know, the different circumstances that they're in? May I follow up, please? I, I this know. will be your last question. <laughs> Thank you. So this past summer when I was hearing about people having, because of the extreme heats we had, both up north and south too, that the outside labor force were, there, they had nobody to address or assist them in working 115, 120 degree temperatures. So we do, we do training with SCATs and, and we work with um, the companies to make sure that they have the proper protection for their workers uh, and to notify them. But we have to rely back on the federal standard, which isn't, which isn't perfect really for our workforce. So uh, we had looked at having a state standard, um, but we could not get you know, agreement on that and really dropped um, going forward with that standard. Uh, but but at, at some point in time, we really need to do that. And there's a lot. We found out there's a lot of different issues that we need to address. Without you know basically dodging the issue, it's complicated, and it needs to you know look at what's happening on the outside as well as what's happening on the inside. And it's different in Washoe County than it is in Clark County. Um, but we do have a lot of heat-related deaths. Um, both in the western region, especially you know in Arizona, Nevada, and Utah, and we really need to look at you know a standard that works for our um, our business community as well as our workers. I appreciate that. Thank and thank you for the indulgence, Chair. I appreciate it. Any other questions, Assemblywoman Torres? Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my question has to uh, is in regards to the resources that you have online. What efforts, if any, um, has your office made um, to provide these resources in other languages, specifically Spanish, which is spoken by a good portion of our population? I do see online um, that I can find like the prevailing wage claim form, general employment claim form. Those are only available in PDFs in Spanish, but you can't do the online form in Spanish, which is interesting. Um, and then none of the business resources that I find are in Spanish. Terry Reynolds, for the record, we are working with, we have uh, probably language services, uh, people who speak multiple languages within all of our divisions. And I think we're one of the few departments that has broad um, uh, capability for multiple languages with, within our facilities. And having our, um, our business units and our, our agencies located in really a couple buildings within uh, the Las Vegas area, we're able to, to do that. Um, we are in the process, we just got um, our, uh, in, in the Office of the Labor Commissioner, we just got uh, our forms and everything uh, in, in Spanish. Um, and so we're working on, and we have Tagalong, uh, we have different um, uh, language capabilities that we're looking at, but we will ha be having that within the next probably year uh, and adopting that within multiple uh, agencies to be able to have that capability. Thank, thank you, I appreciate that. And you know, I just to speak to that, so some of the forms might, they have a translated version, a PDF, but mm -hmm. they're not online not available. Not. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's a pretty quick adjustment. You could even have English, Spanish, and Tagalog on the same form. You don't have to have multiple different forms for it. Um, uh, additionally, you know, I, I do think um, the, the lack of business resources available or even there's no information online for individuals to know, like if you do need help in a different language, this is the line you contact. Um, there's like nothing on the website mm -hmm. for me to even know that I can call somebody and that there's anyone in this office that speaks a different language. I think it would be helpful if in the future um, the office had some type of information available because it, it seems like you do have language services available. Yeah. But if I didn't speak that language, I literally would have no idea that your office even had people that spoke my language. 
Good, good point, Terry Reynolds for the record. And uh, we are, like I said, we are working on that. Um, frankly, we just shifted gears in terms of coming out of the pandemic and all the stuff that we had on our website on that and then shifting back to uh, you know, putting back our information that we had, uh, regular uh, business information for that. So uh, we, will, um, we will do that. Uh, and that's a very good point in terms of the PDS versus the uh, um, online to be able to fill out that information. So, mm -hmm. Speaker Yeager. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good to see you, Director Reynolds. Um, I had a, just a couple follow-ups on that heat, the heat regulation issue. Um, as you're aware, that came in front of Ledge Commission a couple of times. So the first question I had was, you had mentioned something about the federal government. Um, was Nevada required to adopt something, or can you just remind me what that interplay was between what the federal government was doing and the regulations uh, your agency was proposing to the Legislative Commission? Terry Reynolds, for the record, that was an advisory um, standard. That it wasn't a standard actually, but it, and it was an advisory that they put out. It was, and there were guidelines to to follow, uh, but it wasn't a firm. You have to do this uh, from federal OSHA. It was an advisory standard uh, for that. So we are obligated to inform businesses of that. We put out a guidance for that but it's not the same as having an official standard to be able to do that, which we're, we're before your um, Ledge Commission on. Sure, thank you. Madam Chair, could I ask a follow-up, please? Go ahead. And you know, to, to that point, I believe those proposed regulations were in front of the Ledge Commission on two different occasions, and um, uh, the Ledge Commission is split 6-6, and mm -hmm. so we were not able to get those regulations passed, and. I just remember discussion from some of those who were opposed to the regulation saying that they thought that was discussion that was better saved for the legislative process rather than going through the regulatory process. And then of course overlaid on that we have the new executive order about regulation. So I guess here's the question, um, is your agency bringing forward any legislation to try to look at these, these heat issues to put into statute? And if the answer to that is no, are you aware of any of the legislators doing that? Because I know that was really what, what was proffered at Ledge Commission was it should be the entire legislature deciding this and not just the smaller body of the Legislative Commission. Terry Reynolds, for the record, uh, we are not proposing any legislation on that. And primarily that was because of the transition and being able to um, you know, make that transition in terms of what uh, issues to take forward. Uh, but I... Um, I am not aware uh, of, I know it's, it's hard to decipher. I mean, we're looking at all the uh, proposed BDRs and legislation and it's hard to decipher what's in those and they're confidential up to a, up to a point. Um, but we expect to see something happen in that area over time. Uh, I will tell you that with the voluntary um, protection program that we run uh, through safety training and consultation, that uh, we are seeing businesses adopt standards individually within their business, uh, and, and we like to see that. I mean, that's, that's a very good approach. So we're seeing uh, heat safety uh, guidelines within individual businesses, uh, especially, you know, that have workforce that work outside uh, or chain restaurants that, you know, have heat standards within uh, their organizations. We're seeing it develop through that, and that may be something that we, we start seeing uh, because there is a, uh, is a liability, uh, but there also is uh, good sense in protecting your workforce. So uh, we're starting to see that happen. Great. Thank you so much for those answers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? I have one. This is going back to what you stated earlier about the unlawful passenger transportation continues to be a significant risk. Do you keep track of how many of these unlawful drivers you find that, we'll just say a month? We do, and I can, this Terry Reynolds for the record, we do, and we can get you those statistics. Uh, but I can tell you that, um, in certain times, we only get the tip of the iceberg uh, on that, and we know that there's there's a lot more, especially you know when <clears throat> you have um, events, large stadium events, uh, or the uh, 
Electric Daisy Carnival, we know that there's a lot of illegal um, uh, drivers and, and people giving rides uh, out there. Uh, we know that there's a lot of uh, issues of people being uh, overcharged or um, criminal activity that happens, but we can give you the statistics on on you know how many that we see and, and we're enforcing. We are uh, asking for additional enforcement personnel because of that, um, especially as the convention traffic, special event traffic ramps up. And with the new hotels, we know that it's gonna be a consistent issue. It, it's just a fact that it's happening. If you can submit that to um, the committee secretary. And so I guess my next question is, how many enforcement personnel do you have now? I can get you the get you the, the the numbers on that. I can't get it off the top of my head, but uh, uh, the good news is in taxi, uh, we are starting to get back up to uh, some normal levels in terms of rehiring people uh, because we have the funds to be able to do that. Where we had to lay off almost forty people uh, within that organization. <clears throat> in NTA, they're financed uh, basically through through the industry and through assessments. And so um, they're doing better, uh, but they're still short in terms of being able to put on different shifts um, to have you know swing shift, graveyard shifts to be able to handle activities. Most of our problem activity uh, in there uh, with taxis and with uh, NTA happens between probably 10 p.m. and 2 p.m. 2 a.m. Excuse me. So, but I'll get you those numbers and how many people we have to be able to do that. But we're very short. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Director Reynolds. Thank you. Committee members, as you know, throughout the session, committees are asked to introduce BDRs to begin the bill process. They are then assigned a bill number and referred back to the committee. Your vote to introduce the BDR is not an indication of your support. It is just to get the bill printed and assign a bill number. Does anyone have questions? Today we have BDR 54329, requires licensing of pharmaceutical sales representative. Do I have a motion to introduce BDR 54329? I have a motion from Vice Chair Howdigy. Do I have a second? I have a second from Assemblywoman Monroe Moreno. Any discussion? All of those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries. As our last order of business, it is public comment. As a reminder, the time for testimony on the bills we have heard today has passed. Please address your remarks to issues that fall within the jurisdiction of this committee. If you direct your remarks to issues over which this committee has no oversight, I will ask you to redirect your remarks. Public comment is limited to two minutes per person. Please remember to state and spell your name for the record and indicate your affiliation, if any. For those persons who wish to provide testimony telephonically, please call 669-900-6833. When prompted, the meeting ID, please enter 848-915-17321 and press pound. Is there any public comment here in Carson City? I don't see any. Do we have any public comment in Las Vegas? Are we from Las Vegas? Okay. <laughs> BPS, are there, is there anyone on the line? Chair, the public line is open and working, but there are no callers at this time. Thank you so much. Are there any comments from members before we adjourn? 
That concludes our meeting for today. Our next meeting will be Friday, February 10th at 1.30 p.m. This meeting is adjourned.